We're gonna give everyone a few seconds to join and get their audios figured out. And then we'll get started. Thank you, thank you for joining us this Saturday morning. And welcome to In the Field with Man's BFF. Brought to you by the Nevada Department of Wildlife. Hosted by Ashley. Ashley's going to be leading today. Um, she's had Josh for some assistance and training stuff. So we're putting him on there too to give him a little bit of credit. But it's going to be Ashley today. And I'm going to, I'll let Ashley introduce herself and give the background here. You want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Ashley Easterday, and I actually have been instructing for Endow for a few years. Uh, me and my husband are actually archery hunters for quite a few years as well, but we do have English setters who love to work birds, and so we do do upland game. I'm a big chucker hunter, and my husband loves pheasant hunting. We do tend to pay attention more to the dogs working the birds than actually the kill of the bird, but you know, <laughs> so that is pretty much our background. <laughs> All right. And then I'll be doing, I have a couple slides and I'll be doing the moderating. So if, if there are any questions, go ahead and um, drop them in the Q and A box. We'll get to that in a second. And I will either answer them or direct them to Ashley. And so I do thank you. Well, go ahead. I was going to say, I do have to apologize. We were going to do some demonstrations, but the weather here is not cooperating. So there will not be any demonstrations happening. It is raining and like 20 mile per hour winds going on and off. So apologize in advance. <laughs> <laughs> We've got good substitutes. All right. <laughs> so thank you for joining us for the Nevada, with the Nevada Department of Wildlife for a Conservation Education Program. It's a family friendly program and is rated PG. Profanity and inappropriate behaviors will not be tolerated in the chat or the Q&A. All topics and questions put in the chat box in the Q&A should be on topic. Failing to follow these guidelines will result in being muted from the chat and Q&A or possibly being removed from the live stream. I have a loose agenda for you. Um, Ooh, we've already got a question, but we'll, we'll get there just in a second. Okay, so welcome. Um, today we're covering in the field BFF. You, we are gonna go over equipment for not only what Ashley uses in the field, but also what she does for her dogs, their equipment, what they take out on hunts and um, conditioning as well. So if you have any questions, drop them in the Q&A box and I will get to them or I will direct them to Ashley. Um, following the webinar, you will receive a link to a survey. We strongly, I strongly encourage you to fill them out. Give us your feedback. Let us know what you'd like to see more of or if there's topics you'd like us to cover. So we have a, a little disclosure here. So although the products that we're showing and demonstrating throughout this webinar, these are products that we use in the field and we're not endorsing a single product. We encourage everybody to go out and find the best product for them. We're just basically demonstrating the products that we use. All right, so we're gonna start off with just some tips for any hunter. It doesn't matter what you're hunting, birds or game or whatever else. Our very first and foremost thing is safety, always being safe in the field. And then make sure you have a hunt plan where you're hunting, you've got everything laid out, people know where you're at. And we encourage no solo hunting, try to hunt in at least a, a pair or group. First aid, bring a first aid kit, we'll get into that too. Have basic survival skills, especially in Nevada with your hypothermia and those type of conditions, snake bites, bees, that type of stuff. Conditioning for, your, for you, yourself as a hunter and for the dogs. Have your hunter's education pre-planned for that. Right now it's all online. Know your hunting locations and land ahead. Know the laws in each state where you are hunting. And the key to it all is just practice, practice, practice. And with that, 
I am going to pass the reins over to Ashley. And we already have a question. This one's going to be super, super subjective. So um, what is the best hunting dog? I know I have my opinion. I know you're going to have your opinion. So actually, I don't think that there is an opinion when it comes to the best hunting dog because each breed is specific in what they do. So it's more what the handler is looking for in a hunting dog to decide what their best breed is. And when I say that is, are you going upland? Are you going after ducks? Are you going after waterfowl? You know, do you want a flusher? Do you want a pointer? Do you want a retriever? Um, a perfect example is we run English setters. Uh, they are not a flushing breed by general. We are actually use the huntsman math method and we go back to um, where they originated. They, they actually do not flush. It is their job to find the bird and it is our job to flush and they are to retrieve. Um, obviously, you know, labs are a perfect example. They're more waterfowl bird and they're a retrieving bird. So it really depends on what the handler is looking for in a bird or in a bird dog and a companion. And also I wanna bring up personalities. Um, I have a lot of friends that have German short hairs. I laugh because me and my husband will go to these seminars and even our friends that have German short hairs, uh, you put, you know, we call them chain gangs and I actually have a picture of ours on them. They're probably the number one training to get rid of trash as we call it, that anyone could possibly use. It is the most funniest thing because certain breeds, you know, they want to please their handler and then other breeds are like, screw you, to be honest. And it's so funny because you can tell the different personalities and then there's labs. Labs are happy, go lazy, goofy all the time. So like I said, I wouldn't really say that there's the best hunting breed of a dog. It really depends on the handler's personality. Um. So I'm just going to go ahead and talk a little bit about the gear I use. I really actually like Proas's Upland Vest for females because there's a lot of pockets. It fits me well, and I can handle, a, carry a lot of what I and my canines need in the field. Uh, if you want to go ahead and hit the next slide, please. So this first picture, um, so actually is them on the chain gang. And this is probably, we don't use it when we're in the field, but we do use this regularly when we're training or ma doing maintenance work or when we're out these seminars. Because if your dog can contain itself and learn to control itself and not use energy and listen and pay attention when it's on a stakeout, then it's not gonna use its energy and work itself up. For instance, when it's in a car, before you release it to go hunting, it's gonna learn not to whine, not to chew, not to do any of that. You can get a lot, uh, you can get rid of a lot by them just learning to essentially behave on a chain. Can you explain what that chain game is and then what the stakeout is, what it composes of? So this one is actually, it's just two chain. It's a long chain and it really, I'm not going to say what size that one is. That one that they're on is ours. And I want to say it's four feet and it has about four tie outs on that, that come out and it's just cable, um, that ties from the bottom to the top of their collars. Um, there's enough room for them to lay down. As you can see, they can sit up, they can move, they can reach their water dishes but there's not enough room for them to sit there and play and chew and be disruptive. Uh, usually they can go anywhere from four up to eight dogs. You can buy them in, or you can make them. Um, again, me and my husband use the silent method in the field. So we don't use any voice commands. Uh, we do use um, Trichonics. Both of our dogs are trained off of a low stimulation. Uh, the first one that had is the tricolored setter. His name is Tweed. He is about five and a half years old. 
He actually has run um, dog trials before and he does quite well in them. The second one, his name is Winston. He is an orange Peloton English setter. He is actually deaf. Um, he runs off of Trajonics and he also knows sign language. Me and him have actually went to LA. He has been in the Hallmark Channel American Rescue Dog Show and he has made semifinals. Uh, he actually was the start of this whole entire thing because when we had adopted him from a 501c, I didn't ever, I've always chucker hunted, but I didn't anticipate that with the deaf dog, I would, he would actually want to hunt. And I do two and a half to five mile walks every morning. And he started pointing on every walk we, where we live, there's a ton of birds. And so finally I was like, well, I better find a trainer that can train me to train him. And so he kind of was the start of this whole process. So we do use the silent command. Um, and I will say the tie outs, I, they just come in really handy. Even when you go camping and stuff, when you need them to take a break, that's the other thing. Cause a lot of times dogs will run themselves into the ground and in heat, you, they have to, especially in Nevada weather, you have to make them take a break. This is a perfect example to where you're making them stop and take a break and get a drink of water and cool down is another good reason to why we do that. Um, the second picture actually was taken a few weeks ago. Uh, we went and did some maintenance work now that um, checker season is closed um, out at Naughty Dog Kennels. And they are actually doing study to the flush. There is a pigeon about, oh, I'd say there was 100 yards out. Um, and they were actually the dogs backing up my first English setter, Winston, which is him on point on the third picture. No one is holding those check cords. That was them. They were just, they stopped on their own. Um, and we had a really good video that we took where we actually had this set up going, but it was a little blurry uh, when we did it. So, but we can get to that video in a little bit. If you want to go ahead and go to the next slide. Oh, there's a question. There is a question. Um, well, it's not really a question. It's a comment, but. Okay. Um, so I think maybe our reception is having, you're fine coming through with me, but I'm wondering if my transmission is having issues. I'm not too sure, but I will try to figure it out. Um, could you really loosely, you said you talk, you, you got, you guys use the silent method. Uh -huh. You talk about a little bit, the, maybe the, the guides, the signs that you use or talk about what that is. So with the silent method, we actually use tritronics. We don't really use a lot of hand signals once they're transitioned. Um, Winston would know, like we do use hand signals for stop and woe in the field when necessary. Um, and they, we take a knee for them to come, but we do normally use a low one for them. Um, most of the time that's just, if we need them to come back or turn to look at us, if they're working too far out, because normally they pay attention to us and they'll turn before we need them to turn and they'll run their pattern before us. Um, but if we do, we do take knees for them to come back. Um, when we, when a bird goes down, the second it goes down, we'll take a knee and put a hand out and that's their cue after the gunner has shot the bird, that's their cue to retrieve. Um, and then whoever has the handout and is on a knee, that is their cue also to drop the bird in their hand. I hope the audio is getting better. I hope the audio is going better, but I'm not too sure. So Nicole, if you wanna give me some feedback and let me know, I would appreciate it. Oh.
All right, can you see it, Miss Ashley? Yes. All right. So the uh, one thing I do work on is I do try to make sure that what they eat in their diet is extremely as clean as I can get it. And I really read ingredients. Um, canine um, athlete came out a while ago and I started using their electrolyte powder in the field for about a year and a half now when they came out with it. And then it works so well. It's one thing that I always use in their water, whether we're training or hunting. I also use it when we're camping, fishing, whatever we're doing, it seems to work very well. They came out with a vitamin and joint supplement. Um, I have used that now for about a year. I had a 16 and a half year old border collie and she still went on walks every day with me. And she was on prescription joint medication, but when I started giving her that new dog, it really, really made a difference in how she was walking. So I started adding that into all of their diets. And I do think it has made a difference. The other thing that they came out with is a probiotic powder. And I have used other probiotics and enzymes that just seems to be the best. You know, just like in humans, gut health for them is really healthy too. And it tends, I have noticed a huge difference since I've started um, giving it and really watching what's in their diet. The second picture is stuff that I take when I'm just going to do some maintenance work and conditioning. Um, one thing that I always really am big on is you never want to take an unconditioned dog out hunting with you. Main reason is they can overheat very easily. And I've also learned that you can learn to read your dog very well. You know, I, I've seen a lot of people who a couple hours into the field, their dog starts coming back to them and handlers get very upset and they think their dog's being lazy and not listening. And when it comes down to it, their dog's trying to let them know that they're overheated. They need to stop. So I try to keep my dog's condition all year round. I watch their weight. Um, obviously, when they come out of season, they always usually have lost a couple pounds. Uh, this season, Winston actually did pretty well, but Tweed was the one that lost a few pounds. So we had to get a couple on him, but I try to keep them all year round from not gaining too much. Um, so the second picture is what I would take when I'm just going out to work them to keep maintenance work up. Um, I actually recently just got the new Garmin Plus Pro that does the tracking and is the regular training. So I'm going to start using that instead of the Alpha. Um, I use a Kamar um, 209, just their blanks to shoot. And that's what I use with Steady with the Flush. That is the video I was going to show you. Uh, basically, the dog goes on point, even if you have dogs backing up. You shoot that primer the second you shoot it, a bird's released, um, whether it's dead or whatever, your dog that was on point first goes after you give the sign, retrieves, brings it back. Uh, we do that quite periodically. There's also the 20 inch check cords in there. Uh, we use those for different methods. You saw that how they were dragging that in the last video. We also use those for certain training stuff like the woe post. Um, the biggest thing that that helps is when they're in the field, once we run their patterns, they learn to use the pattern of the cone scent. Uh, Winston tends to burn his nose a lot because he's uh, very fair skinned and white. So he gets sunscreen a lot. And the other thing in that bag that you can see is actually the electrolyte powder. Uh, the third picture is what I would take in the field with me for the dogs. There's the water dish because that powder does need to be mixed. And that would be a bowl, water, electrolytes. I always bring snacks. I don't give them a ton because, excuse me, I don't want them to have gut issues and get twisted gut but I do usually try to bring them apple slices or jerky or something like that. Um, I always bring a canine first aid kit that has all the basics in it. 
bolt cutters. I have had a dog run into um, bailing twine before and into um, fence material. I've also seen a dog run into a cat trap, which is why I bring bolt cutters. Uh, obviously, you're always going to have your charged garments, trichonics, if that's what you use. Uh, tweed actually in certain rocks, he gets cut feet up pretty bad. So I do run him in boots. And then of course you want a condition for a dog. Next slide. Oh, does anybody have any questions? I want to show that video. Oh yes. Before we get here. So let me, I'm going to stop sharing and then do you want to show the blurry video? Do you want to attempt? We can attempt it. Okay. I'm just going to silence it because of the wind too. And then maybe you okay. could just walk us through it and just kind of, okay. What's going on? So Winston is actually over to the right. He is the one that is on point. It is his bird. Um, the person walking is the gunner. He's about ready to shoot a blank. Tweed is the one closest to me. And it was just fired. As you can notice, none of the dogs took off after the, after the bird. Um, he just flushed the bird again himself. All my dogs are still steady to the flush. Um, another, that's just a human running across. So this one is just basically practicing study to the flush and honoring another dog's point. Oh, hold on, sorry. I thought I unmuted myself. I'm working on the other one right now. <laughs> okay. And this is the one that you use. Do you want to give us a little intro before we start it? Yes. So since we couldn't do a lot of demos, we were trying to find one. This one is not a kennel that I've ever been to, nor can I say anything about it. But this one is a little bit more basic training. This is when you're just starting to teach your dog study to the flush. And this is without using gunfire or anything like that. This is literally just releasing a bird and getting to it to stay. Hey, we wanted to share another training quick tip with you. Here. So as you can see, no matter what, um, no matter how he kicks it. And the dog did exactly what he was supposed to do. You're allowed to turn. He did come forward, but he, the dog's allowed to turn facing where the bird went. So that was really good job. And now he's healing. Turn again. So this is pretty much the same video. Uh, this is pretty much the same exercise we were doing, only we had dogs backing up and we were using live gunfire. I have to say probably the number one thing, especially for being out in the field, or anywhere is to make sure that your dog's recall is there and that your dog knows how to woe because whether you're in the field or you're not, there's so many things that can go wrong. You know, whether they're darting out of a door, darting out of a kennel onto a dirty, onto a busy street, or you're out in the field and you're about ready to prevent a mass casualty or they're so far out and you need them to come back to you. Uh, so I think those are the main things. And there's so many little things that you can do, even if you can't 
you know, go out on public land and work your birds just by going for a walk every morning and making them heal or putting them out on a stake or something like that. Any of that stuff, you know, is that, and anything is a training, even when we're out in the field, you know, it's still a training. It might be a train wreck one day and it's still a training. You know, I remember, I think it was like the third day that we went out this last season my Winston decided that he was going to flush his own bird. And if our dogs flush, we don't shoot those birds. If they don't, you know, if they don't point at them, then we don't shoot them. So it doesn't always work perfect, but they do do pretty good. We have fun. You just got to enjoy it. Okay. So just to reiterate, that's that whole conditioning and keeping the dogs conditioned year round in just like we encourage the hunters to be conditioned year round. You don't want to try to get in shape two weeks before your hunt. It's the same thing with dogs and that constant, like you said, whether it's going to be a total chaotic day or not, it's still considered conditioning if you're working with them. And that's the key to it all. Yes. Nicole, um, it is best to start as a puppy each, you know, there's multiple training methods out there that say what age to start them and how to start them. So my, it, it is best to start them as a puppy. And the best thing that you can start as a puppy, no matter what, is you can get rid of the barking, the biting, the chewing, you know, putting them on a chain, letting them learn that they have to be steady and quiet is probably your first step, but yes, starting them at a decent age is always good, but not necessarily true. Um, you know, Winston, the deaf dog, he was three when three and a half when we started him and he's amazing. So it is good to start him as a puppy, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not going to make an incredible dog or they're not going to win trials if that's what you're trying to get at. Okay. So Typically, you see whether the dogs are hunting ducks, pheasants, chucker, pigeons, whatever it is that they're hunting, um, a general guideline and what most programs, if you're sending your dogs to training, would recommend is like six months to two years on average because they're just like kids. That's when they're most absorbent. Um, and then again, nipping those issues in the bud early on is far better. So starting them when they're a puppy. So the biting and all of that lovely stuff. So like a typical program would run in phases. And then your first phase would be like basic obedience. Mm -hmm. And then um, like a phase two would be working on like fetchings and then your basic commands, like your hold, your drop and your fetch. And then also delivering to the hands with that soft mouth. And then your phase three is pretty much your conversion to the field. And at that stage, the dog's ready for their first season of hunting, whether it's waterfowl or upland birds. So typically that's like a rough basic. So the earlier you wanna use your dog. So the earlier you get your dog in training, the more you're gonna be using your dog out in the field. And it also depends. Do you want to send your dog off to a trainer or do you want to do privates to where the, the trainer trains you and you train your dog? So, yes. or do you want to just learn it yourself? It, it, that there's a multiple options too. So yes. And oh, Nicole. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Okay. So there's your, yes. So I am the person I don't send my dog off. I did privates and I did it myself. And then me and my husband go to those seminars um, we use the hunt Smith method. You can actually, and that is the silent commands. You can go online and you can buy books and he actually, they have videos for most of them. Um, and there are, there is a kennel near Reno actually in Lovelock, Nevada, that is certified through him. So it really just depends. You got to decide which it is, but regardless, if you decide to do it yourself or send it off, that training doesn't end when you get that, when you, if you send it off, that training doesn't, it doesn't end for you. You have to still work with that dog day in and day out, whether you get that dog back or you're the one that did it because it has to know that you're going to keep it up. It's, it literally is like we said, maintenance and conditioning all year round. Completely. We, we send our dogs off 
and ours are more focused on waterfowl, but we go out and work with them. So it's kind of a combination of them. But then when they come home, you're the main one working with them. So it's just, it's your preference. If you feel like you have the skills and the knowledge and the you know want and desire and time to be out there with your pups and training them, then like Miss Ashley, then that is, it's awesome. It's awesome. But if you're like me and busy all the time, then <laughs> I've got to resort to, to having somebody else do the, the lead work for me. Well, there's really no, I mean, there's no right or wrong either way. It's just my biggest thing was, it, you know, mine's deaf and I wasn't going to do it. <laughs> you have a whole different like scenario <laughs> there. It's and then once you learn how to do it, like I did, then you just do it. And I go to those seminars. So, <laughs> but there really is no right or wrong. Like Don said, you just, it really is what fits and you got to find the kennel that you want and the training method that they use that you want. That's the other key when you say Don. So I wanted to throw out there while we're discussing it. So the Sierra Nevada Retriever Club is doing hunt tests on April 29th and 30th. And then again on May 1st and 2nd at Harmon Reservoir. And you could definitely go out and observe what kind of some of those field trials look like of people actually running with their dogs and they're planting, loading wingers with dead ducks and planting dead ducks for blind retrieves. So if you are interested in observing that and seeing what it looks like firsthand in a safe, socially distanced outdoor setting, that is an option as well. It looks like they're starting around 6, 7 a.m. and then running till um, around 5 p.m. So that's an option. And if you're interested in actually working it, Ashley, <laughs> then <laughs> I should have known. <laughs> if you're interested in working it, again, they're looking for people to load wingers and dead ducks and plant dead ducks for blind retrieves, and they'll be providing lunch and you get paid to do it. So if anybody's interested, you can definitely rip out your phone and take out a picture and email me. I'll give you some more info there. Um, and then Ashley's information. So if you have questions that you'd like to direct to Ashley off screen or later on, if you're like me and lay in bed at nine o'clock at night and go, oh my gosh, I should have asked that question. Then there is her contact information as well. Otherwise, I always encourage everybody to take their, their phones and screenshot it. Otherwise, let's see what we got here. And one more thing. And just to reiterate, even if you send your dog off, there's still those trainers are going to make you go and learn what they taught you. So it's not like you're thrown into this whole thing and you have no idea what commands or anything were given. Correct, Don? Right. That is yes. exactly what they do. You go out and you actually do the commands and you run with them with their check cords and, you know, putting birds out for them and having them retrieve them for you. You do all of the work because at the end of the day, when they come home in six to nine months, whatever the case may be, you know, depending on what you're sending them in for, if when they come home, you're going to be the one that's working with them for the rest of their life. So it is so important as their handler that you're spending that time with them and knowing those commands and that that dog works with you. And if you're not alpha, you're not going to get anywhere with that dog. Oh no, they push you around like crazy. You they have to be crazy. alpha. You yep. have to be alpha. They push like crazy. So you got to let them know who's in charge. So, but... I would like to thank everybody for spending your Saturday morning with us. Hopefully you got some good information out of there. And if you're interested in any more, go ahead and email one of us or reach out to one of us. But our, our little motto right now is just embrace the door and embrace the outdoors and practice responsible recreation. <laughs> and Thank you so much for attending. Ashley, thank you so much for attending and sharing your knowledge and your information with us today and showing off your pups. Well, thank you guys all for being here.
Let's see, we have one more question. Oh, Nicole says, thank you. Thank you for mm -hmm. hanging out with us, Nicole. Yes, thank you, Nicole. And for the questions. On that note, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up and have a great rest of your weekend, everyone. Ashley, I'll let you answer that one. Um, where are good areas to check or hunt? Uh, I honestly cannot answer.